Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this caricaturized Panzer III medium tank. The model in this video is built for my own personal collection and is not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects for models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. This model here is slightly outside of my normal working subject. However, if anyone is interested, you can contact me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. This model here is built entirely out of the box. There are very few, if any, modifications that I personally made to the model to bring it up to the condition that you see it here. In this video, we're going to be giving the model a thorough inbox review, as well as discussing several of the model's key features. There are also some other caution areas that I want to mention about the model's construction in order to help anyone who's potentially working or will acquire one of these builds. So stay tuned because there's going to be a lot of info coming right at you. To start this video, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. That's right, it's that time of the year again. It's officially April 1st, 2021, which means it's time for the ECA channel's tradition of posting model showcase videos of World War II's builds. This time around, we have the Panzer III. More specifically, I believe this would be the Panzer III ALF M or N. It's the Panzer III with the short barreled 75mm, but with the added shirts and armor protection. Like I mentioned, this model here is from the World War Tunes lineup. World War Tunes is this computer game where it has a very unique art style in that everything has these weird cartoonish type proportions to them. This is specifically true for the vehicles in question. The vehicles, although they have these weird, strange proportions to them, still have the look and the feel of the real vehicles that they are patterned after. The game itself came out a number of years ago, although I'm not even sure if it's even still a thing, because apparently the game developer folded up and sold the rights to some other company. But regardless, the World War II's model kits are still widely available and hopefully are still in production with new ones that are in development. For a while, it seemed like every few months or so there was a new lineup of kits released by Meng, and hopefully this stays true as the years progress further. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when the model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this Meng World War Tunes Edition Panzer III. This kit here is kit number WWT-005 and released by Meng back in 2017. These World War Tunes models are known to be extremely easy and simplistic to put together. And from what I've been told, the newer generation kits like this one here are even simpler to put together compared to some of the kits from their first generation lineup. And after building the kits from the first lineup, those kits themselves are, again, really easy to put together. So it's interesting to see just how they go ahead and simplify it even further on their other generation releases. This model here I picked up off of eBay for around 19 to 20 some odd dollars, which is basically the going rate for these kits. You can find them anywhere from the high teens to the mid 20s. It just depends on the vendor and the location you purchased it from. One advantage that these kits do have is that they are really easy to track down. Like I said, I picked up this one off of eBay, but I've seen them for sale on Amazon. If you do a Google search, you could find them as well as even snagging one at a local hobby shop or so. So availability of these kits are pretty good. Starting with the graphic design, you can see the vehicle's illustration here. It is decently rendered, which is something that is a trait that's shared with the other World War II's vehicles. It has these two diagonal lines that come across the two ends. Here we have the Meng logo, the World War II's logo here in this little gear, as well as the other information in this cartoonish type font. And I think I'm the only one to mention this on YouTube or basically anywhere, but the reason why Meng has this type of graphic design is if you take two other Meng kits and line them up side by side, they create this really cool banner type effect, which was done for a retail type setting. So if you have a store shelf and you have all these kits lined up, it makes for a nice little presentation. On top of that, if you have a few of these kits in your collection, which I don't see why you wouldn't, by the way, and you want to have them displayed with the box art by having them in this format here, it also makes for a nice little display. With the camera back in, we can review the other portions of the box art, namely right here, we have two other samples of the vehicle's profile. And this is something that's interesting I saw in this box, is that the name of the game developer has changed from Rukvan to Rascali. Here I have another World War II's kit, and you can see the difference with the two game developer logos. Now, I have no clue if 
this changed or this is just a a modern release of this 2017 kit and they changed the graphic design on the box and the older ones had the old one. I can't really tell you that, but I just want to bring that up because it's something that caught my eye. On the side panels here, we have the same type of configuration which is seen on the other Wolverine's kits. Same thing with the opposite side. On this panel here, on the other ones, we had a little advertisement for the Meng paints. Rather than this, we just have kind of like a Tamiya type format where it has the other kits that are offered in the lineup, which is pretty interesting. Here we have a 38T, the Firefly, that little pink Sherman for one reason or another. The, looks like they're going into ships now, it's the Skarnhost, and they have a line of bombers, and that's clearly a Lancaster. We have some other corporate info on either side, and on the back panel here we have another little billboard or banner for the video game, as well as just like you see on the other World War II's kits, renders of the vehicle in-game. On the back portion here, we have, of course, the Olga approved mark, as well as the other corporate information. Cracking open the box, like with all the other World War II's kits, they are a side opening flap type system, which is relatively unheard of on other kits out there, but for the World War II's, they seem to be the exception to that rule. And like all the other World War II's kits, they all come sealed in one giant bag. Dumping out the contents. On this kit here, all of the components are made out of injection molded plastic. And on this particular build, they are molded in this Panzer Gray type coloring. Some kits I've seen in gray, some others in Dunkel Gelb. It just depends on the vehicle that you're working on. This runner here consists of the turret. It also has the shirts and components. Unlike the Panzer IV, where the Schertzen was one piece around the turret, and this one here, it seems to be two. Be interesting to see how that goes together. We have the gun mantlet, cupola, exhaust manifold, and a bunch of few odds and ends. Here we have the antenna in its retracted state, in its, on well, the real one would be a wooden, uh, wooden channel. But here you can see it's just molded as one solid piece. Here we have the upper hull. It all has those really wonky proportions, but the quality of the moldings are pretty good. These are made with modern molding machines and technology. And just because the kit's all cartoony, the quality of the molds are really good, which is, you know, what we'd expect from a company like Meg. Here you can see the grills. And that little bit of equipment right there. Can't exactly tell you what it is right now. Rear plate, hatches. A few other odds and ends, probably for the shirts in. This model here has the running gear divvied up on two identical runners, which is something that's seen on a number of the kits. You can see the quality of the sprocket. As well as some of the road wheels. It's interesting that the sprocket is in this type of format because you know I guess I'm gonna have an extra sprocket on hand which is something that you don't really see on these World War II's kits. Generally when they build up there's no spare parts but I don't know this one here it doesn't really seem to be the case but we'll see as the build goes. This one has separate torsion bar moldings which is interesting. Usually they're just integrally molded to the hull. And you know a few other odds and ends. Here we have the lower hull. Detailing on it looks pretty good. The quality of the moldings are excellent. It's a nice chunky bit of plastic and these, like I said in another one of these videos, these vehicles when they're built they do have a nice little weight to them. They're chunky, sturdy little models. And that's it for the components made out of polystyrene or the standard type of material. And this now takes us to the components that are made in vinyl. Here we have a small little section of rubber poly caps, very Tamiya-esque. I believe these are probably gonna be for the sprocket and the idlers. We'll, we'll see, of course, as the build goes on. And here we have the track. Tracks are really nice. They have some really good thread pattern on them. Kind of remind me of the Tamiya old school Panzer III kits from the 70s, but it's not really here nor there. On the inside, we have some interior detailing. This type of detailing is found on some of the other World War II's kits I've seen. And the material is really nicely molded. 
It's got a nice flexibility to it, which is what you would want for something like this. Here we have a small little water slide decal sheet. From what I've seen on the other World War II kits, this decal sheet here should be really nicely done. The decals are printed with modern printing technology, and from what I've seen on the other builds, they're really good quality. So I'm not expecting any problems with that. Going down to the last thing in the box are the instructions. Just like with the other World War II kits, they have some very nice presentation to them. It's a really good graphic design. They're not your plain old, you know, vanilla black and white type drawings and renderings. These ones here are full color, and the illustrations are CAD drawings, and you note they are colorized, which makes for, again, a nice little presentation, and it does make the build a little bit easier you get to see exactly where things are. Oh, it looks like I'm not going to have spare parts. Apparently the sprockets and idlers are one and the same, so. Starting with the model shirts, and just like with the Panzer IV kit that was released, the tank here has a removable shirts in feature. This is true, obviously, for both sides. The kit's design is very similar to the one on the Panzer IV, however, it falls slightly short. What I mean by that is fitting the shirts in onto the model is difficult on this one compared to the one found on the Panzer IV. On the Panzer IV, I had no problems getting the piece to pop on in the original kit configuration, you know, unpainted, as well as even with the paint and the varnish added. For this one here, that wasn't the case. Even originally, the shirts in, had a hard time fitting into its appropriate locations. In order to do this, I needed to take a square needle file and enlarge the hole slightly in order for the components to fit. Even after the model was fully painted and weathered, I had to utilize the exact same procedure again just to get the pieces to fit into place. The pieces are still technically removable, however, trying to take them off, even for just filming, has been something that has been very difficult, so much so that I run the risk of breaking something, so I'm just going to leave them on throughout the duration of this video. Which is one of the warnings, by the way, I want to mention about this kit here. If you are working on it or you are contemplating on getting one, keep in mind that the Schertzen is going to need a little bit of hand fitting in order to get to properly fit onto the model. From there, this now takes to the suspension. The suspension and the lower hull detailing on this model are pretty well done. One interesting feature is that the tank has a four sprocket design, which is pretty unique. Generally, the Ferdinand was the only one to have this type of a layout, but again, for the subject matter at hand, it works. The track is fully rotatable, like you can see here, so if you want to play with this model on your rug, feel free, this thing will work just fine. Obviously, for this model here, that's not going to be the case, because the more you do this type of a trick with it, the more the paint and the weathering will wear off of these locations. But if you feel so inclined, yes, you can go ahead and play with this one on your rug. Moving up takes to the bow machine gun. Just like what I frequently mention on these builds, the bow machine gun is molded solid, so a pin vise and a small drill bit were used to drill it out. Also, like I frequently mention, if you do not have either of these bits of equipment, you might want to avoid this procedure because you could potentially ruin this bit of detailing. Moving up takes to where the coax machine gun would have been. The model does have this bulbous machine gun that gets glued into its position over here, just like what we saw on the Panzer IV build. However, on this one you'll notice it's missing. Well, that's because during the process of the construction, the piece popped off, went to Lost Partia, and rather than making a new one, I kind of like how the vehicle looks without the bulbous piece fitted. So I just went with the format that you see here. While on the front takes to the front visor as well as the two backup sights, you'll notice on this one here I went ahead and painted everything with a coat of gloss black and even with a little brush of gloss lacquer just to give them a little bit more sheen. This same procedure was also done on the Panzer IV build that I just mentioned. The remainder of the model's details are pretty well thought out, namely the tools. We have here a set of tow cables on the back, a couple sets of spare wheels, a fire extinguisher, as well as the sledgehammer and the axe. All these details go on without any problems, but the one thing I do want to mention, of course, is the axe. With the way the tank is designed, you notice that the axe has to be sandwiched between the hull as well as this bracket here that holds up the shirts in. On my models, the tools are added at the very tail end of the build, and because of that, I actually ran into a slight problem when it came time for mounting of this equipment. With the way the piece is molded, you're going to have a hard time fitting this component in place due to the molded in tool posts that we have here on the back. Luckily, I was able to get it on without any problems, and honestly, I just got lucky 
with it. If I was to do it again, the axe would have been permanently glued to the model prior to the model heading off into paint, or I should say prior to the addition of the shirts in. It's probably easier to do that and then try to paint and work around the axe as opposed to doing it like the way I did. Although, honestly, it's not really ideal doing it that way, but it does make the assembly a bit easier. On the other components, they went out without any problems, but again, just like with many of the other World War II's builds, the tolerance is found on the holes as well as the pegs is a bit stiff, which again can possibly cause breakage if you're installing the parts. If you're working on one of these builds, invest in a set of needle files, as well as possibly even a pin vise and some small dremel bits. This will alleviate the problem of the stiffness of these parts and will really make your build go by with much more ease. On the opposite side, which may be hard to get in this lighting, but we have the antenna and it's in the retracted state. Everything is integrally molded on and just with paintbrush, I was carefully able to paint the antenna inside of its trough. Moving up takes us to the turret and the turret detail, starting with the cupola. Just like with many other World War II's models, the cupola hatch is designed to be operational, but use the little C hinges that I mentioned before. Just like I mentioned on a few other builds, the C hinges are okay at best. They do allow the hatch to be installed easily and give it some functionality, but the hinges don't really hold the hatch in place too well, so the hatch has a tendency to wanting to pop out, and if it does, it can easily get lost, to which then you're going to be pretty much screwed. On these models here, I tend to just leave the hatches in the closed position just to prevent this from being a problem. From the cupola, this now brings it to the side turret hatches. The hatches are nicely detailed and feature a separate molded in handle. However, on this build here, the tight tolerances went ahead and bit me and the handles broke off during construction. Rather than trying to track them down, I simply fabricated two new ones out of two pieces of wire. Bringing us to the turret shirts, and the shirts on this model required a little bit of extra work in addition to the ones that I mentioned before found on the side hull. There are some knockout marks found on the inside portions on both the turret shirts and as well as the side hull shirts. And these were all polished away with a little bit of red putty and some sandpaper. And with the one on the back here, with the way it's designed, there's going to be a center seam running in this portion over here. On this model, I simply went ahead and added some bodywork and polished it away with some sandpaper, leaving for the seamless look that we have here. The remainder of the turret shirts and installation went by fairly easily. The little struts here went to their appropriate locations and once installed made for a nice strong and sturdy piece. From the turret shirts and this now takes to the paint and the markings. This model here has the camouflage scheme which is known as the Kharkov pattern which basically is the panzer gray but with spots of Dunkelgelb that are airbrushed on either in spots or in stripes. I'm not really sure if a Panzer III of this type of vintage would get this pattern. This pattern here was a relatively early war thing, and the Panzer III with the shirts in on here, if I'm not mistaken, was something that came a little bit later on. Having said that, though, with this vehicle subject matter, the rules of historical accuracy get kind of bent, so in this case here, it works for this build. I always did like the look of the Kharkov pattern on this model here. It really does make it pop. It's a very nice sharp pattern and something you can possibly look into on your own build. For the camouflage application, like what's usually seen on my builds, it's all done via the airbrush and then washes and dry brushing are added in order to get the look that you see here. For the markings, the model's worst slide decals were utilized. The decals are a really good quality out of the box and were simply just added to the locations which were requested in the instructions. The decals then were lacquered in place via the VMS varnish, which did a really good job in keeping everything nice and secure and to eliminate any hint of decal shine or silvering that may be present on water slide decals. At the end of the day, I'm really happy in how this build turned out. These World War II's models are always a blast to work on and this one here was no exception. Sliding us into skill level and recommendations, this model here can be built by basically anyone, from the novice to the expert. Although, I will say that because of the shirts in this does make the model slightly more complicated compared to some of the other kits in the lineup. Having said that, however, a beginner can tackle one of these builds if they take their time and they watch out for some of the key points that I mentioned in this video. Because of the model subject matter, you do have a bit of artistic licensing that goes along with one of these builds. You can build it as conservative as you want where you basically just build it out of the box with the kit supply components, or you could go ahead and customize super detail, scratch build stuff for it to your heart's content. There is, I notice, a growing cottage industry out there of individuals who are taking these base kits and taking them way past the original 
kit offering where I've even seen complete 3D printed conversion sets for the various kits in the World War II lineup on the market. And by the way, that's actually pretty cool. On to recommendations. First and foremost, if you're a fan of the video game, you'd be foolish not to have at least one or more of these kits in your collection. Outside of that type of a person, if you're the type of individual that likes to work on World War II German armor or just, you know, standard plastic model tanks in general, these kits here are a great addition to add to your collection. They add a little bit of variety and have a little charm of their own that will enhance the other builds that are sitting in your collection. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this caricaturized German Panzer III medium tank. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content, being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here, or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in the loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build, as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that are frequently posted to this channel. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Till next time, catch you later.